In 1984, PSA, the company that comprised Peugeot, Citroën and Talbot, was in a bind. They just spent a couple of years designing a car that didn't fit into their new lineup. Should they scrap it, launch it, or give it away to another car company? Just how did PSA get into the odd situation of developing a car that they didn't have a home for? And did it succeed, or did it flop? This is the Peugeot 309 story. To tell this story, we need to talk about the American car company Chrysler. Both GM and Ford had a strong European presence, and by the 1950s, Chrysler started looking to do the same. They started with a minority stake in French car company Simca, and tried to buy Leyland Motors in the early 1960s, but by the late 1960s, Simca, Spanish Barreros, and British Roots Group were all part of Chrysler Europe. Simca's 1960s and 70s cars did well, mainly in France, but cars from the Roots Group struggled against British and American competition in the UK. British, French and Spanish operations had been left to develop cars on their own, but by the 1970s they started developing pan-European models, following Ford who'd done this to great effect in the mid-60s with the Ford Escort. The 1975 Chrysler Alpine and 1978 Chrysler Horizon would split design and engineering between UK and French offices. The 1977 Chrysler Sunbeam would round out the new generation of Chrysler hatchbacks. One of these cars, the Horizon, would come to Chrysler's aid in their home market in the 1970s. Cheaper, fuel-efficient Japanese competition was eating into the market share of Detroit's Big Three. Chrysler had attempted to sell its European cars in North America even before the 1973 fuel crisis, such as the Hillman Avenger, sold as the 1971 Plymouth Cricket, but had never had much success. Chrysler tried again in 1977 with their first world car, the Chrysler Horizon, sold as the Dodge Omni and the less successful Plymouth Horizon. Like the 1980 Ford Escort, the European and North American versions of the car would have very little in common. But the Dodge Omni would live on until 1990, selling close to a million cars. But despite this, Chrysler was in a financial mess in the late 1970s, and something drastic needed to be done. New CEO Lee Iacocca would turn the company around with a K-car platform in the 1980s, but to develop this he needed to get rid of distractions that were sucking cash, such as the European division. Chrysler Europe was put up for sale. The French government, keen to keep the old Simca business going to save jobs, encouraged both Renault and PSA Peugeot Citroën to submit bids. In the end, PSA won out with a high, high bid of $1. This might seem like an amazing deal for a range of new cars, and a business selling light vans and trucks, but underneath the glitz of the dealer's showroom, Chrysler Europe, or Talbot as it was now hastily renamed, had serious problems. Tooling, particularly in the UK factories, hadn't been updated for years, and although sales were respectable in France, profits were suffering, especially in the UK. As an example of how little money each British car was bringing in, the most profitable part of the Coventry factory's business was exporting kits of the ancient Hillman Hunter to Iran. As a side note, the Hillman Hunter and Iran have a long and interesting relationship, and it was still being manufactured there in 2005. With French ownership and French investment, it was perhaps unsurprising that French jobs were the priority, and Talbot's Linwood factory in Scotland was closed in 1981. However, Talbot's design and engineering centres in the UK and France were still open for business. Work had finished on the new Talbot Tagora, and attention turned to the Talbot Horizon replacement. It was decided to reuse common components as much as possible, so the chassis would be based on the upcoming Peugeot 205. Somewhat more surprising was the choice to use the 205's doors as well, which involved some creative car design so the car wouldn't look like some sort of Frankenstein's creation. The car soon got a name, the Talbot Arizona. It would have a small rear bustle, just like the newly released Mark III Ford Escort, which was selling better than ever. 
The smaller engines, developed by Simca way back in 1961, would be lifted from the Talbot Horizon, but the larger petrol and diesel engines would come from parent PSA. The public got an inkling of what the Arizona would look like when the Vera Plus concept was shown in 1982, and later the Vera Profile in 1985. Like many car designs of the time, this was a study into making a low drag car. By 1984, development was progressing well for a 1985 launch, but Talbot's star was dimming. In 1979, they'd sold 120,000 cars in the UK, but by 1984, that had shrunk to just 25,000. The new Tagora had been a flop, and sales had ended in 1983. The Peugeot 205, on the other hand, was a hit that was creating a resurgent interest in the Peugeot brand, and ironically was killing demand for the Peugeot 104 based Talbot Samba and the replacement that was being designed. The larger Talbot Alpine didn't have a replacement planned at all. Talbot dealers were getting less and less traction, and despite fleet managers' protestations that they would have a harder time selling a line of Peugeots or Citroëns, the Talbot brand was retired. This left a dilemma. The Talbot Arizona was almost ready for release. Should the car be canned, or should it be released, and if so, what badge should it wear on the front? The car was larger than the Peugeot 205 and Citroën AX, and smaller than the Peugeot 305 and Citroën BX. In the end, it would be chosen to fit between the Peugeot 205 and 305, where it would allow Peugeot to take on the Vauxhall Astra and Opel Cadet. This would also help plug a hole in Peugeot's lineup, as the 305 replacement, the 405, was a much larger car. With Peugeot still selling the 205 and 305, they were initially at a loss as to what number to use on the new car. They ended up going with the 309, which seemed like an odd choice as the 309 was smaller than the 305. Maybe calling it the 209 or the 303 might have made more sense. It wasn't just the odd numbering that made the car stand out either. Its styling, being planned for the Talbot line, didn't really fit in with a Peugeot lineup. PSA announced the demise of the Talbot name in 1985, and in October the 309 was introduced to the world. It was produced at the old Chrysler factories in Poissy, Madrid and Coventry, with the UK factory being brought up to date thanks to a £30 million investment. Peugeot threw a large advertising budget at the car, not just in the UK, but in France as well, where the old Simca brand was still well loved. But they might have oversold the sound system just a little bit. Sales were brisk, and as the Peugeot adverts kept telling us at the time, the line was going from strength to strength. Customers discovered the 309 was a good value family car, although over time they also found out that the build quality could have been just a little bit better. Soon the five-door models were joined by three-door versions, along with a diesel engine. The 309 SR was supposed to be the top of the range model, but arguably the pièce de résistance in the 309 range arrived in 1987 with the GTI model. As the 309 used the 205 chassis, and the 309 GTI used the 205 GTI's engine, not surprisingly it had a lot in common with the well-loved hot hatch. 0-60 times were virtually identical, but the limited edition 309 GTI 16 had a higher top speed. You could even buy a 309 GTI for less than the smaller Ford Escort RS Turbo. The 205 is such an iconic 1980s hot hatch that the 309 is often overlooked, but it's no less fantastic. In 1989, maybe to cash in on the environmental movement, Peugeot France released the green model. The car sold on its fuel economy, but returning 55 miles per gallon at a steady 56 miles an hour from the old 1.3 Simca engine wasn't anything special. After four years in 1989, the 309 got a facelift. The rear grille and lights got a new look, but up front the grille changes were more subtle. 
Inside, the dashboard update made the car look more modern, but perhaps more importantly, the old multi-piece dashboard that was prone to squeaks and rattles had been swapped out for one that was less squeaky and rattly. The old Chrysler era engines inherited from the Talbot Horizon were slowly replaced by the TU engine used in PSA's other cars, along with other diesel options. These sold well in France and increasingly in the rest of Europe, and PSA was proving themselves to be masters of both frugal and sporty diesel engines. To drum up sales, UK customers were treated to the high-end sporty Goodwood edition in 1992. Fancy features such as leather seats, power steering, and a CD player were accompanied by rather appropriately for the good wood edition with various wood accoutrements such as a wood trimmed steering wheel and gear knob. 398 were produced, but sales were slow and it took two years to shift them from dealers' forecourts. But all good things must come to an end. The 309 had been shoehorned into PSA's lineup and it never quite fit. The 1993 replacement would be the 306, starting a more coordinated line of models ending in the number 6. 309 sales ended at the end of 1993 after selling an amazing 1.6 million cars in just 8 years. Not a bad way for the last vestiges of Simca and Roots to end on, and many people from both companies found their way into PSA where they continued to make great cars. Yet it wasn't quite the end for the 309. The tooling would be sold to Indian company Premier Automobiles Limited, and production would begin again in 1998, five years after 309 production had ended in Europe. Only 1.5 litre five-door vehicles were offered, but labour issues and a new relationship with Fiat put paid to production, which ended after just two years. There was an interesting twist to the whole saga in 2019, when PSA, the company that had bought Chrysler's European operations in 1978, merged with FCA, the parent of both Fiat and Chrysler in North America. It starts a whole new era for both companies, and who knows, maybe Chrysler's will start rolling off the old Simca production line in Poissy once again. Just how did PSA get into the odd situation of developing a car that they didn't have a home for? And did it succeed or did it flop? And why is there a car making a loud noise outside? With French ownership and French investment, it was perhaps... That, that sentence doesn't even make sense. Oh no, it does make sense. Customers discovered the 309 was a good value for The 205 is such an iconic 309 sales ended at the end of 1983. Probably not 1983, because that would be two years before it had first been released. So that's probably wrong. 